So that's in your tables directories. We don't have to do too much work there. And then uh, in the Rhinex directory is where you put your local Rhinex files. And again, most people have been asking, well, how do you know about data to process? Well, basically, anything that's in the Rhinex directory on the day you are processing, by default, get processed. And so there, again, there is some options to have that not happen. But the default is everything gets processed. The sites.defaults file tells the which international archives to get data from or which station to get, put them in that Rhinex file. So it sort of happens automatically. That was the design of the system. The standard way then to run gamut is simply to say sh gamut minus experiment EPT. These are all minus signs. Uh, and then the name of the experiment, that's a four character code, we call it G-I-A-N. And then minus uh, day, year, and day of year. If you want to, you can put more days after this. So you can say, do days one, five, seven, eight, whatever you like. One of the things when you do that is if that, if any of those days fails, it will actually stop at that point and won't do the other days. So there is some advantage to, if you're doing multiple days, to actually do one line for every day. Um, and that's something which, as you learn to shell script, is something you can learn how easily to set up a file that basically you put these lines in the file for each day you want to process, and you execute the file. And that will cause it to, to run uh, for everybody it's, um, as you go across. Now, the other option we used here was minus no FTP. That option only works if you have already FTP need all the data uh, that you need. If you have not done that, that option will not work. And the advantage of using that option is that if, and what we've done, what was done to set up this was the getting of the orbits and that external Rhinex data and the broadcast ephemeris information was all done specifically for the data that we were processing beforehand because we were having issues with the speed of the FTPs. And so once that was done, you could just use the minus no FTP option. If you're running the same day, you know, multiple times, uh, and you then, you know, it's often sometimes useful after the first day, provided all the, everything's being downloaded, to use that option. Because even when you are um, reprocessing a day, the software tries to make sure that you're doing the latest processing possible. So when you run SH gamut every time, by default, it will go out and oh, is there more data from site default? Has that turned in the archives since I last processed and I can now download it? And we'll do that. We'll check, oh, has the orbit been updated? Should I download a new orbit? And so if you have a slow, it, what we'll normally decide is no, it checks the FTP. No, nothing's changed. If you have a slow FTP connection, can really slow down your processing because it'll take time for it to go out and check those things. So even if you're, when you're reprocessing, if you've already downloaded everything, then using the minus no FTP option is actually not a bad solution if you have FTP connections. So the standard upper level of processing, and again, if you go back and you do that LS, which is list for a directory list, uh, at the level of our project, you'll see that the typical things you see in here are these BRDC. These are the broadcast navigation files. We need those because those contain the information about the errors in the satellite clocks. That's the dominant thing we get from those, is just the clock errors on the satellites. They also contain the satellite orbits, but general, you know, the broadcast ephemeris, but those are quality of only a few meters. And so they're not good enough for what we want to do. So we typically do not use them to do that, although if we get desperate, we can start from them if we need to. So these basically are used for the clocks. This is what we call SHGetNav, is the thing which gets those. The G files, these are our representation of the GPS satellite orbits. Now, we talked about the uh, orbital elements of the spacecraft, right? There's the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, all those quantities. When we actually numerically integrate the satellite orbits, those are actually not very useful. What we actually need 
is a Cartesian coordinate of where the satellite is at some time and the Cartesian velocity of how fast it's moving. And from that set of Cartesian values, we can integrate the orbit using a numerical orbit integrator. And so the G files, actually, that go in this directory for each day contain, at a given time, the actual X, Y, Z coordinates and the velocity of the spacecraft and then some other parameters which have to do with the radiation forces on the spacecraft. And so it's just a set of numbers and we use those to integrate them. And so we generate those from orbit files that we get from the IGS. And those files are in a format called SP3, which is satellite position version 3, essentially, uh, as time has gone on. So uh, G files and those we're going to find will actually be in this IGS directory. So the other one we're going to come to later on today is this directory called GLBF. This is where we're actually going to put some binary versions of the solution that are going to be generated that we use in Globe K. And the Globe K solutions we tend to run in a directory called GLS, Globe K solution. And so we'll come to these later on. These get created for you. And then we're going to have templates that get put in. These we'll look at later. IGS is where we save the orbit files that we actually download from the IGS. And it's just a convenient place to keep them separate. Rhinex we've already talked about. Tables we've already talked about. And then for every day you process, we day directory. And it keeps everybody separate. Um, and again, if you're you know, processing sequentially, there's not a big issue. Uh, even if you're processing things at the same time, it's not too, if it's in separate days, there's no big issue. There is some subtleties that can happen with time tagging. Uh, but generally, unless you're running a big parallel processing on a high performance computing system, you're not going to have those issues. So, so these basically go by days. There's a format to these can take this options when you run SH gamut. Uh, where you can actually put the year in this, just not the day. And you can also put a net, an extent on the end of the name. So generally, it always has the day of year in it. Uh, there's a little program I was meant to show you yesterday called DO. If you type DOY, <laughs> it will uh, tell you how it runs. The day of year, it converts time formats. And so generally, you can give day of year, and then you can give year, and month, and it will tell you what the, tell you what day of year is. It'll tell you what the GPS week number is, and uh, uh, day of week for GPS, etc. Or and it'll tell you these other dates, which are the Julian dates and the modified Julian dates. All these different time systems that people use. Do year will tell you that. And based on how many arguments you give it, it'll actually convert between them. So if you give it one number, it'll assume it's either a modified Julian day, date, which is a number like 544, and it will convert it into year, month, day. If you put a W after the first number, it'll take it to be a GPS week, etc. So it has lots of little ways to convert the thing we use to convert back and forth between these different representations of days. Generally, uh, gamut 50 to 60 sites is about the largest network we process. We probably won't talk in detail about this. I think we have some discussion of it just for those of you who might be curious and want to really get into this. When we set up the sites.defaults thing, we did it manually. But if you have a large number of stations you are processing, there are software we have that will actually set that up for you automatically. And you basically just go to an archive and download what is available for data on that archive. And then it will set it up so you can process all of that data. And those are the high-end, uh, large-scale processings, which are something that you might evolve to eventually. Uh, if it's a little bit advanced for a beginning course. So we have NetCell and then another one called Global. NetCell is for writing up some region of network processing. And then Global Cell is one which allows you to do global uh, distribution uh, based on trying to uh, get the optimum positions for stations around the world. And there's a shell scripts that control these as well. <coughs> so tables, as I said, is um, there's this concept in Unix called linking. And LN is the thing which does it. You'll see it. What linking is it just creates what might be called an alias. 
So the file appears to be in the directory. It actually points to a different location. It's very useful when you have the one file that you want to have appear in many, many different places. And there's always what we call soft links, which is ln minus s, which means the link remains as obvious. You can actually see it's a link. There's another one which I suggest you do not use, which are called hard links, in which you cannot tell anymore that it's actually linked. So it, it's sort of like cutting a shortcut. Yeah, exactly. A shortcut, it's exactly that's what it is. It's like creating a shortcut. Um, and one version of it, the shortcut would no longer be... Hmm? That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, exactly. So it's a... Uh, and, was, and so what we do in tables big files in particular, we have links to them. Um, and again, gamut processing occurs in the day directories, the globe K processing, as we will see uh, later on today or tomorrow, certainly tomorrow, occurs in the G solution directory. Okay, so there's files that automatically get created. I'll let you sort of read this at leisure, I think. But the, uh, again, most, as you saw yesterday, you didn't really need to do much, right? But behind the scenes, you saw all that stuff coming through on your screen. I would recommend at some point you actually look at that and see what's there. You might have noticed when you hear it, I would go back up and back up where something had gone wrong. Lots of things happened when that did. And provided, again, you have an FTP access or you have the data you need, it generally happens quite automatically and you don't seem to worry about it. But when something goes wrong, it's worthwhile to have some sense of what has actually happened. So the satellite orbits, uh, we get those from the IGS typically, and they're in this file called sp3 format, which is just a tabular XYZ coordinates, every 15 minutes actually. And so from those tabular files, we can actually fit our orbit model, which is what we represent in these G files. And so the G files is what we actually use in the gamut. And then the program that does that integration is called ARC. And if you look at your screen going through, you would have seen ARC. It becomes obvious because you actually see all the different satellites. It tells you what the block type is as it goes across. So that's the orbit integration. We talked just about the Earth centered, um, Earth fixed system and the Earth centered uh, space fixed system, or the inertial system. You have to transform back and forth between them. What's Interesting is you need to do that transformation for the orbit integration because the orbits have to be integrated in an inertial reference. It's easiest to integrate in an inertial reference frame. And so back and forth between those, we need these Earth orientation parameters that take us from where the rotation axis is of the Earth on some day back to where it's normally supposed to be relative to the fixed crust of the Earth and where it is in inertial space so we can get those. Those are done through Earth orientation files, and the ones used in Gamut are called UT1 dot and wobble dot. <laughs> wobble is the name for polar motion that people often use. Channel wobble uh, is where that name. Those get downloaded uh, automatically. They do download from a, um, typically from a US uh, military site, the US Naval Observatory, because it's responsible for doing the rapid Earth, or, or rapid Earth orientation parameters for the world. You know, if you're working close to real time, that has to happen. But what we're doing, where we're working in the past, we have all those values. When you upgrade the tables, we'll talk about what files you need to upgrade to keep Gamut up to date. When you update tables, you will get the latest versions of those files. So provided you're not working within a few days of when you do that, you normally would not need to download those. That is checked to see whether you need new versions. If you don't, it keeps them separate. So those get automatically downloaded. Leap.second is a file that gets updated approximately yearly. This is a problematic file because uh, leap seconds are needed because the Earth's rotation rate is not the same as our atomic second. And so every, depending, one year to two years to 18 months, we need to add in a little leap second to keep the universal time coordinated, UTC, synchronized the T1, which is the rotation time. We unfortunately do not know when leap seconds will occur in the future. And so when we distribute this file, we take a guess at the next leap second. And uh, we will actually put a tag. And when that time 
approaching, you need to get the new version of that leap second file to make sure either to have that date extended if there is not one, or to actually put the leap second in if it actually did occur. When we update tables like that, for everyone, we recommended that you all register the license for Gamut, which you can do through your institution. Or actually what you get is you get a, each institution has a single point of contact. Uh, and so whoever that person is, is the person who's responsible to make sure all these files keep getting updated. When we update them, we send an email out. And the reason we like a single point of contact is because that email list now is several hundred people and if we're not careful when we send out the emails, it looks like a spam attack. And so it gets put in the spam folders of everybody. <laughs> and so <laughs> we've had actually a couple of issues with that. So, um, uh, so we think about that, but this is one that you have to keep an eye on. Uh, the satellite clock files, uh, these come from the broadcast ephemeris. You generally do not need to worry about these. The other one is this receiver and antenna characteristics file called rcvant.dat. This again is a file that will actually need to be updated uh, periodically. And again, it depends on whether you've just gone out and bought the latest version of the hardware. If you've just bought brand new receivers, there's a chance that that receiver was not known about at the time you actually and you need to update for that. If you're using equipment that you know, your 50, Trimble 5700s, your Trimble Net R9s, your Septentrios, Polar RXs, we know all about those receivers, so that should be fine. It's only when brand new equipment comes out that this gets updated. And again, there are things like the IGS actually send out messages when new geodetic quality receivers or receivers that we can process become available. Uh, there's this differential code bias file, which I talked about briefly early on. Uh, that gets updated approximately monthly. And that is one that, again, if you're working it's be, biases change with time on each one of the spacecraft. So if you're working in you'd better make sure you've updated it. If you're working in you're fine because we know what the values were back then. Anytime before basically the beginning of 2018 your current file is fine but if you are processing data you know, a few weeks or a month at a time you need to keep this file updated to make sure you have those. That has to do with the ambiguity resolution. That's its main, it's, the, actually having that file wrong is not completely disastrous, because all it does is it affects how well you can resolve the integer ambiguities on the spacecraft. And if you, uh, if you get those integer ambiguities not resolved, it makes your results a little less precise, but it doesn't actually hurt the results per se. But it is for getting the highest quality results is what you should do. There is another one called the phase center models, antmod.dat. Again, this always gets linked into tables. Again, if you don't buy a brand new antenna that's a new model that no one's ever seen before, you should be fine. So you, the antenna you're using, is, the one we're using in our processing is a Trimble uh, Geodetic Zephyr 2. That's been a long time. We know what. But when a brand new antenna comes out from a menu, you need to update that. This file gets updated, again, approximately once a month. And that's because that's how quickly people bring out new equipment or new calibrations become available on newer equipment. Uh, Lunar solar ephemeris and uh, nutation data in tables. This is one thing you do need to update yearly. Um, we talked about the orbit, briefly about orbit calculations and stuff like that. But the sun and the moon actually have quite large impacts on the um, orbits of the spacecraft. Even Venus actually has an impact on GPS satellites at the level we need. So you need to have ephemerises for these bodies. And again, those ephemerises are generated by numerical integration. But as with all scientific stuff, we have improved data. You know, the satellite, there's lunar laser ranging that always is getting us new data for the moon. So the ephemeris for the moon keeps getting improved as time goes on. So once a year, you need to have new versions of those files uh, to carry the year. We can project forward a year easily with the current ways, but you need to do that once per year. Generally, around the new year is the time you do it. The uh, ocean grid file, this is the one we had an issue with. Uh, we do uh, recommend that you use this, but it is a 700 megabyte file. So for FTPing, it takes a while. Um, and so if you do not have it, you can tell gamut to not uh, use it 
and it requires that you actually change that CES table that we talked about. That's one of the processing changes to tell it not to do that. If anyone wants to know more detail about how to do that, just talk to me and we can, I can show you what you need to change. Uh, there are more things coming in here that are, again, on the edges of getting the state of the art processing going on. And there's two of those. One is these atmospheric loading grids. Um, these are the fact that when you have a high pressure system move across an area, the surface of the Earth actually deforms in response to that. That deformation rate is about half a millimeter per millibar of pressure change. And so 20 millibar pressure changes in large um, you know, high pressure or low pressure systems moving across are not uncommon. That will cause about a 10 millimeter change in your heights. But over a distance scale of a couple of thousand kilometers. So if you're, again, if you're looking locally at um, you know, a 20, you know, 100 kilometer region, it's all going to move the same way, not so critical. So the atmospheric loading terms at the moment are not operationally applied in standard IGS processing. Primarily because a lot of the effect is actually fairly short term and, um, and can be absorbed essentially in the position changes each day. So those aren't operationally used. Uh, but if you do were to use them, you can download them from everest.mit.edu. We keep them uh, up to date as we can. The other one is the atmospheric delay map, what are called mapping functions. Now we spoke briefly about the tropospheric delay. This is just the refractive index of air, which is about 1.0003. And that 300 parts per million, when you go 20,000 kilometers, or actually go through the 100 kilometers of the atmosphere, changes the delay by about 2.3 meters. And then water vapor will change it by another 30 to uh, typically up to about 30 centimeters in the vertical direction. But in the slant path to the spacecraft, those get out to be third numbers like 30 meters or so. And it's that angle dependence, what we use to estimate these quantities in the gamut processing. The standard default is to use basically analytic expressions for those terms. And so you can run that independent of anything else. But if you want the highest possible accuracy, there is a group in uh, uh, the Technical University of Vienna which actually calculates every six hours in near real time. And then they make the results available. And those are called the VMF grid files. Again, we put those on the Everest FTP site for you to download. Those can get quite large per year. And they can be, and you have to update them again every, literally every couple of days as time goes on. They, uh, they get updated basically once per day as new weather systems develop. And so that's uh, something that you might consider doing. Uh, again, that's is one of the active areas of research of trying to perform, you know, improve your own performance is are these uh, meteorological based um, Mapping functions, better ways to go. These are actually based on the global forecast models that are used to do the weather, what are called assimilation models, which are generated globally uh, by the uh, European Center for the Medium Range Forecasting, ECMWF, is the ones that use for VMF. Okay, so the files you need to worry about. Um, the Rhinex. <laughs> you want to make sure that you actually have your Rhinex in the right place so you actually process it. Uh, you should be careful. You are actually coming from raw data, um, you should be careful to make sure you create the Rhinex correctly. So one suggestion I would have for your own stations is to get that antenna type corrected in your Rhinex because having an incorrect antenna type in your Rhinex files makes your life much more complicated. It makes it complicated for anybody else in the future who may want to use your data because then they get confused about what it actually is. So when you, I didn't look to see how those Rhinex were being generated, but um, uh, if it's being done with tech, there's a configuration control file that you can set that information so it actually has the correct information in. And you should absolutely verify what the antenna serial number is on that antenna and what type it actually is. So that's, um, so when you make your own Rhinex from raw data, that's another whole thing. I think there's something briefly about that in the lecture notes. Um, but that is something you have to be careful of to make sure you create the Rhinex correctly. 
So the control files, again, process.defaults usually just minor things, you've, if ever you need to change that. Sys table, again, normally um, you don't need to change much of that. Sites.defaults is quite critical, and you should make sure that you select those sites you want. And then you might modify it. One of the things before is you might have noticed when we were looking at the data results, Dagar, which is, uh, I think on Madagascar, if I'm not mistaken, it's somewhere near Africa, uh, had pretty high phase RMS, 24 millimeters, versus a typical number of about 10 millimeters. You know, debate as well. Do we really want to keep including that site or not? And so maybe we take it out of sites.default so that we don't include that um, later site. Or maybe we'll look around to see if there's another site nearby that might be performing better and that we might use instead. And so the sites.defaults in sense of, that is, pr in terms of gamut processing, decide what extra stations to use is probably the critical decision you make to make sure you have good, high-quality stations uh, that you will make sure you is connected to the global network in a very, very uh, strong fashion as we go across. SIT table, again, normally don't worry too much about it. Uh, the GlobeK, we're going to look at the GlobeK command files um, later on, and there's a couple of different versions of these that we supply as templates, and we'll look at that this afternoon. And again, if, you're, if you have IGS stations, in your solution, you can pretty much use them as they are. But again, these are the things that you will go back and now you want to focus in on what you really want to solve. And that's the bit where you start changing the way you get the reference frame and stuff like that. How you're going to constrain your reference frame, the specific sites you use. We can't set that up for you remotely, right? It's the same way as the sites.defaults. You have to decide what you want to do. The same thing basically with the GlobeK command files. The apriary coordinate files, again, generally are not a big issue, but if um, you have some issues with uh, things being thrown out, then you might want to uh, consider it. Oh, good. Uh, and then the metadata for station.info. We saw how critical that was. And, uh, and again, you want to make sure you have that correct, because if you get that antenna type wrong, and you have to go back, you'll have to go back and reprocess. And uh, you know, even though those runs, you can imagine if you'd done five years of them every day, that that would be a little bit arduous to go back and redo again because you got it wrong. The differential code biases, as I said, if you're processing near real time, then you should download that once per month. And then there's another file called the svnav.dat file. Uh, this is a, a file which, again, if you're processing near real time, you'll have to keep up to date. The problem we have with the spacecraft is that there are 32 PRN numbers. And we're now at satellite vehicle 78, or something like that. So the numbers keep getting reused. And so when we talk about PRN 32, what that actually was depends on when you observed it. And in the future, it could be very well different to what it is today. The spacecraft are designed to last for seven years. Most of them last for well over a decade. But they do evolve. And they launch about two to three new satellites per year as ones die. If you think again with a 32 satellite constellation, they die at a certain rate. And so it's one to two new ones per year. So when a new satellite is launched, you need to know the characteristics of that new PRN. Because the PRN you knew before could have been a completely different, actually often is a very different satellite because they've launched a new 2F and it might be replacing an old 2A that's been there for 20 years or something. So this svnav.dat file, again, if you are processing within um, you know, new data, if you're processing data collected after the time you installed Gamut effectively, you should make sure you get new versions of that file. So when this file gets updated, again, Bob King sends out an email to all the users to say new tools are available and you will get them. So you Ignore those messages. Um, don't forget your password because you still need to uh, go into the updates directory, update tables to actually get this. So uh, process uh, dot defaults. Again, this is what it basically does. Uh, it controls the data processing, some peripheral bookkeeping stuff. Again, most of the time you don't. You can look down it. It tells. It basically just has things that are defined where the Rhinex directory is, or the fact you've named the Rhinex directory Rhinex. You can change that if you wish to, but uh, you don't, if you don't change any of that stuff, it works exactly as it is. Sites.defaults, as we said, um, 
We used this yesterday. It tells you whether you should FTP the Rhinex or not. Uh, and again, the exclude station.info thing is quite uh, important. For all of the IGS stations, we know all of that information. Uh, and so actually for an IGS station, the, the Rhinex headers should be correct. So it's not a big issue. But uh, we know that information and it's not needed to do it. Uh, and again, for your own information, uh, as we saw, if your Rhinex headers are not correct, you actually put it in the station.info correctly. Um, and then there's, uh, you may use um, sort of more things in site.defaults. The minus exp option, that experiment name in SH gamut, that tells the software what lines to actually interpret in these lines as we go through. Uh, and you can actually also have these set by year and day of year. So the default is to first see whether you have in the tables directory a version of this file for the specific day you are processing. Uh, and if you don't, then it will go to the generic sites.defaults name. But what we're doing here, we just need the generic. But when you're doing, again, complicated processing with many, many sites, uh, when we do our IGS processing, for example, we have these by day of year because the network keeps evolving every day as new stations are either used or not used as needed. Uh, the autoclean.command file, again, this we won't look in deep. We'll look at some of the results that come from it. Generally, people don't touch this file. It's got actually quite a large variety of controls that are available for how to clean the data. The only thing that you might possibly change is what's called the elevation mask, which is how low an elevation angle do you want to take measurements down. The default is to go to 10 degrees elevation angle, and that's, that's a really nice sort of compromise. If you go too low, GPS will pick up reflected signals, and the noise gets higher as you go to low elevation angles. And if you go higher, then you have trouble separating the atmospheric delay estimates and you have noisy atmospheric delay estimates. So 10 works pretty well, and again, for just about everything we do, we just leave it at that. But you might look at playing around with that. Um, and then potentially, if you have sites where you really have bad coordinates, um, then there is a way to what we call detune autoclean so that it is not so aggressive in throwing out what it thinks is bad data. Because its measurement is based on the difference between what's observed and what you theoretically compute the, position, the phase to be. And if you have a bad a priori coordinate, then that difference is going to be very large. And AutoClean, when it starts, doesn't know that bad difference, that large difference is due to a bad coordinate versus bad phase data or bad range data. And it will err on the side of saying it's due to bad data and throw it away. AutoClean is designed to be robust in getting a solution through. And if it thinks something is bad, it will throw it away rather than allowing it to corrupt the rest of the solution. So again, normally if you have coordinates, as you saw yesterday, we did not have any trouble with our 10 meter off. So again, normally this is not an issue. This would be an issue prior to the year 2000, for example. We talked about uh, selective availability, which was purposeful corruption of the clock uh, time given by the spacecraft. When you have that, your apiary coordinates could be easily off by 1 to 200 meters. And when you get that far off, AutoClean will start throwing things away. And so, again, pri if you don't pri pri and you don't know what the coordinates are when you do it, it might be an issue. But at post-2000, and anything where you know the coordinates, not a big change. Uh, the apiary coordinate file, again, um, this, we actually have two of these in effect. One of these is the, uh, the one which has your definitive coordinates in it, which we typically default to either uh, ITRF 2008 or ITRF 2014 these days. I think we're still transitioning to ITRF 2014. And I think, I'm pretty sure the distribution has all the ITRF 2014. Uh, yeah, so these international coordinate reference systems, they're developed every few years. And uh, so the latest one is ITRF 2014. Um, we might, I think all of our files still might actually be pointing to ITRF 2008. Uh, at the moment, but, um, but you should have those available. Those are well known, and then you have that file. Every file gets put into a file merged with the more temporary coordinate file, which is called the L file one. And that's the one which your coordinates get updated with if you uh, have a bad coordinate when you start off. So again, normally you don't need to change this. There's this little 
school. It's nearly squares. Uh, so you have um, about a one in thousand convergence rate. So if you have a temporary coordinate off by 10 meters, then the linear doing could actually result in about a 10 error in the so a gamut automatically centimeters is the equivalent of about 0.3 millimeters. It will automatically update your coordinates and actually rerun the solution with those new coordinates as you go through. To get coordinates, there's this little shell script called SHRX to APR. And if you run that, you will actually can automatically update things as you across. And um, again, that automatically happens when you run SH gamut. So you normally don't have to do that by hand. And as I said, the O file is initialized today with the coordinates, and then um, the, the main coordinate file is copied over, and then all of the local L file entries are put across. So actually, if you have a bad coordinate in that main processing one, that gets replicated every day. So you might, if you see that happening, you might go back and look at what's going on. Because you can use any coordinate file you want there. We just have a set to do the IGS one first, but you can actually use your own. Once you get developed, you actually have your own, with your own coordinates and things in it. Um, so you go across. Uh, Station.info, this is the occupation metadata, site name, starts and times, and then the receiver and teller information. And then this SH update, Stimfo, uh, it automatically is um, uh, used, but if your Rhinex headers are not correct, uh, then it will fail, as it did. Um, and so, because it couldn't recognize the type of uh, antenna that we had. And so you can get them from various methods. Um, again, this is a very, very important file. <laughs> Make sure you get it correct. Um, there are log files out there. We actually update this station.info file. We update literally every few days as new changes are made. Again, we have something like about two or 3,000 stations we process. And with that many stations, every couple of days, Something changes at one of the stations. A new antenna gets put in, a new uh, antenna is switched, or a new version of firmware, etc. So we keep this updated. When you update, you will get our latest version of that file put in your tables directory. And uh, so when you want to, um, so for the IGS stations, again, you're processing past the time that you downloaded the software, you might want to make sure that you get the correct data for those IGS stations as you go across. Uh, SES table, it's called session table. Uh, this really controls uh, the output. Uh, again, the type of observables you use, just about everything you're going to use will be the linear free combination that removes the ionosphere. This L1 plus L2 is only valid if you're dealing with just few kilometer, very narrow, very space, uh, very uh, closely spaced sites. The orbit mode, again, most of what you want to do is what we call baseline, which means the orbit is not estimated. Uh, orbit is uh, something where only the orbits are estimated. We actually don't use that anymore. Uh, relax is the one we use, which is allows the orbits to be estimated. You normally won't do that unless you're interested in doing some orbital dynamics. And then it also contains the models to be used, etc., cetera, um, as we go through. So the SIT table, uh, this basically controls just simply some a priori constraints on the coordinates. Again, if you're using IGS stations, you should be fine. You don't really need to change that file. If you're doing local processing, then maybe some of your local stations, you will want to put some constraints in there. This has the form of essentially, there's all, and you usually have a big number, uh, and then individual stations and the quality for each of those individual stations. So when you have your local processing, you might want to put your local stations explicitly in that file. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have entries there that aren't used as you go through it. Okay, so the internal operation of Gamut uh, is to um, first uh, run, and again, you'll see this happen as you go across. Uh, this is a program called Make EXP. This actually sets everything up to be run. Um, and then uh, Make X is the one which converts the Rhinex data to Gamut's internal format version of that, which is called an X file. Uh, and it's very, very, it has basically the same types of information in it, uh, but it's a little, uh, again, it's a pre-run to the Rhinex itself. Uh, this thing called fixed drive actually prepares all of the batch control files. So, um, and that's what actually sets up the whole run. Arc integrates the GPS orbits, models, 
calculates the theoretical delays and the partial derivatives we need for the least squares estimation. Autoclean repairs all the cycle slips, removes phase outliers. It also resolves the wide lane ambiguities, which we will talk about at some point, right? <laughs> Ambiguity resolution. As I said, is just simply the number of cycles between L1 and L2. And then if you know that, then the only thing left over is to estimate the number of cycles at L1, because then you can calculate the number of cycles at L2 from the L1 cycles and the, and the sum. So the L1 cycles is called the narrow lane because it's a short wavelength. The L1 minus L2 is called a wide lane because those frequencies are relatively The beat frequency between them is quite long, and that's where the naming comes from. And there's very different techniques that we use to resolve those two different things. Uh, and, then, uh, and then it also does that, and it creates these H files that we use in bloke K later on. OK, so the steps in the batch processing. Um, again, arc model auto clean for the initial run. We actually run an initial solution um, to get the of the data, and then we rerun it again. So you'll see uh, model auto clean and solve actually run a second time as you go through. There's a little check done in here that if the quality of the data seems to improve too much between these two solutions, it will rerun the, um, for, uh, the second solution again be to uh, improve the statistics model. It'll recalculate the phase RMS. That's pretty rare. We didn't see that happen yesterday. Uh, it, what happens sometimes is in this first run, if you have bad data, there's some bad data that gets through that makes the phase noise look much larger than it actually is. And then this second run actually fixes that problem. And then the third run uses the correct statistics for the final run. Uh, so solve uh, basically outputs. The output file of solve that you may or may not want to look at is called the Q file. Uh, and it tells you all about the um, uh, types of solutions, the things that have come out in your solution as you go across. Um, and then uh, there's also a loose solution that comes out, which is basically the idea is you have some constraints on the coordinates to help resolve the ambiguities. When we go to globe K, we want the system to be loose again. We want it to be free to move as needed. And that solution happens automatically. You don't control, you, you, you can control it, but you don't normally control it. It happens, um, it's set up automatically. Uh, and so the, um, so the updated uh, L file can happen uh, as each day we do update it, um, although generally if there's no big adjustments, it doesn't change. And then the output of globe K is the H file. Uh, and again, this is not particularly, it's not meant to be user -read. This can be read, but everything else is a stack of numbers. Um, and then there's also this other file called an O file, uh, but we don't normally use that. Um, it's an old uh, file format. Uh, which has more machine-readable versions of what's in what's called the Q file. So the Q file is what tells you for each one of the parameters you've estimated, what the query was, how big the adjustment was to it, how many standard deviations that was, what the fits of the data are, etc. It's the actual uh, output solution you can look at. So again, the a priori coordinates files, they come from the L file initially. Uh, if you're not found, the Rhinex, um, there's an option to use the Rhinex header coordinates which actually for post-2000 is perfectly fine. Uh, we actually have the default of to actually use the shooter range in the Rhinex files to compute the coordinates. One of the reasons to do that is for um, a number of types of receiver types, if they do campaign measurements, sometimes the Rhinex header coordinates are actually not accurate. They reflect the previous location. So this is a little bit more robust. Um, and again, these things get modified if the adjustments are too large. So the ambiguity resolution, the uh, uh, L1 minus L2 integers are resolved in the program called AutoClean, and they're passed to solve. Uh, and we do this with this default option of LC AutoClean uh, in the CES table. This works for just about all modern data. It does require L1, L2, and shoot a range at L1 and uh, L2 frequency. So it requires those four observables. Nearly all modern receivers do that. Uh, older data. That was what we call codeless tracking. Doesn't have the P2 shooter range, and this will not work. But again, just about everything post 2000, this has not been a big issue. So this is what we use. Uh, and the L1 minus L2 integer ambiguities 
are um, based on the pseudo range measurements. And so that uh, is a fairly robust way to do it. There's also another option called LC Health for codeless data. Again, uh, that's something which is way back before 1995. The narrow lane, which is the L1 resolved, and that's resolved by site, by solve itself, and it does depend on the quality of the fit to the data. Essentially, you, you're estimating these parameters. One of the parameters you estimate then is how many cycles of it was there at the beginning. That number should be an integer number. It's, it's actually not an absolute value. It's the difference between two satellites and two stations uh, done in combinations. And, uh, but it should be an integer value if all of the a priori models and the fits are good. And so solve bases on how close is it to an integer as to whether to resolve it. And as you resolve each one, it actually helps the other ones as you go across. So it's done sequentially. Uh, and again, that's, uh, uh, we get the report on that. So the summary that comes out, this is the file we looked at yesterday. This is the SH gamut and then the day of year summary. This is emailed if you have email set up. It basically tells you something about how many data you processed and then the summary of the statistics. It gives you the statistics of all of the sites uh, so the post-fit RMS, um, these are in millimeters, and so 4.5 gives you the best two and the worst stations that you go across. It then tells you the information from solve, and there's sort of four numbers that come out here, and again, these numbers should all be around about 0.2. Uh, the detail is the first one is the um, constrained uh, solution with the ambiguities free. The next one should be a little bit larger because that's the constrained solution with the, or with the ambiguities fixed to integer values. And when you fix you reduce the degree of free, that pushes up the normalized RMS, uh, typically. Normalized RMS is square root of chi squared per degree of freedom. Um, and it's uh, just a simpler way to say it than that long thing. Uh, and then uh, the final ones are the loose solution, which is what's going to be used in, uh, GAT, in globe K. This number should always be less than the one above it because all the constraints. And again, the fixed one should be a little bit larger than that. And in case uh, 95% of the uh, narrow lane, uh, the wide lanes were fixed, and 85% of the narrow lanes, which is very similar to the numbers we were seeing yesterday. Uh, and then it will tell you any of the large adjustments which we saw yesterday. So things to note, make sure that the stations match what you expect. Post-fit RMS residuals are 3 to 10 millimeters. Uh, that no station has a zero RMS, which means that the data got all thrown out. The post-fit normalized RMS of solve is around about 0 0.2, and that most of the ambiguities are resolved. And again, 70 to 80% on sort of noisy days. Uh, in really good days, you get 90%. Short baseline solutions are not uncommon to get 100% resolved. Um, as we go through. Okay, now the thing we haven't done yet with that data, which we will be able to do, uh, which will be a good chest test of uh, GMT, <laughs> plot what the phase residuals look like. And this can be really illuminating for uh, looking at uh, potential problems with antennas, etc. So we have this shell script. Um, uh, well, actually, you can automatically happen. Uh, in gamut, in SH gamut, by putting on this minus PRS elevation option, there's also a, uh, uh, a little one way, which I don't give the name of there, SH one way that actually does this, and we can actually play with this. These sort of called sky plots. Across the sky. And then and green residuals, and the little red tick bar is 20 millimeters. So what you're expecting to see is all of these fellows be all sort of squiggles about the size of that little red tick mark, which is what this site actually has. Down the bottom, it tells you what the phase RMS is, which is sort of diff difficult to read on that. And it's 5.5 millimeters. So this particular station, this is a 5 millimeter station, uh, larger than this typically. The other ways we as a function of elevation angle. And this is particularly useful if you've got the wrong antenna type. Because often what you'll see is this will look quite systematic. So this one looks fine. And what you see is this very 
classic thing you see is, see the little beading in the residuals? Did you see these peaks? And actually, the red line in the middle is an average of all of those residuals. And you see it has this little oscillation up and down. That is ground multipath. And just about every station you see has some level of this. And if it's oscillating up and down like this, that's actually not too bad. That's part of the noise in the system as we go through. So here's those sky plots expanded out. Uh, and so higher residuals in the same place at the same time of day, like you see this little dip in the yellow, the dip in the yellow there. Uh, da, 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 da. So if you see the same pattern occurring, like that green blip, that, these are six hour blocks for 24 hours. If you see the same pattern occurring in the same spot in the sky, that generally is repeating multipath. If you see one of these frames where the residuals look larger than all of the others, that's generally some atmospheric delay modeling problem. And it normally means that something happened at that time. A thunderstorm passed through, some severe weather event happened. Uh, if you go back and look at the meteorological records, you might actually be able to work out what it was. But generally, these are a good indication of repeating and whether something else strange happened. So that high residuals appearing in one place sort of suggests that it's a water vapor modeling issue. So again, these phase elevation plots, this is what you expect to look like with the wrong antenna type being used. And so you can very clearly see this systematic bend in the residuals uh, as you go across. Um, so again, this is good diagnostic material that you use. Generally use. You don't use this all the time. When you're first evaluating a site, you look at it and then you turn it off. The, um, you can burn a lot of disk space on the files that are actually used to do all these plots. OK, so what can go wrong? Uh, a site's not listed that you're expecting. Maybe you just didn't have Rhinex data for that. Maybe you put it in the wrong directory and you didn't uh, realize that. It was not a short Rhinex file. You may have uh, thought you had it at a certain time and it wasn't there. Oh. As I said, the software is set up nominally the is set up using 24 hours of modern data. Uh, there is a setting in the process.defaults, this is what you might change, called min xf. Minimum X file size that it will process. Short session data, and you're only processing two hours of data, 24. You might want to go in and drop that number down by an order of magnitude or make it, I think it's 300 by defaults. The units are essentially kilobytes, so little, uh, and so you might drop it down by a factor of 10. Uh, and if you'll see, there actually um, an X file that you might see called uh, dot small, which means it was too small to be processed. If you see that happening, and it's not what you expect, check this number to make sure that you're actually doing that. Uh, you have a site in the solution, but no data or adjustment. It could be that the a priori coordinates were just far too far off, and it got thrown out. Or it could be that the data is a bad receiver. That happens. Uh, sometimes we look at that. Uh, we, there's a program called CView, which I think, I'm not sure we're going to talk about very much, but it's uh, documented. Uh, what CView does is allow you to actually have an interactive X Windows viewing of the residuals. It allows you to see the L1, the L2 phase residuals, the wide lanes, etc. And you can look at it by station and by satellite, and you can form differences between them. You can form double differences, et cetera. And that's a good program to use if something really bizarre happens and you don't understand it. It's actually go in and it'll let you visualize what the data actually looks like. You should probably play with a good data set first to see what to expect, and look at your bad. automatic checks on that house. That doesn't really happen very much anymore. Um, so uh, problems with the apriori coordinates, they do need to be good, typically better than 20 meters or so. Um, you can look at various outputs from the AutoClean summary that's quite detailed. The AutoClean, uh, so in all the shell scripts and all of the globe case stuff, if you just type the program name, it'll give you help. What that program and various things. AutoClean, it's actually really massive because it actually displains in detail all of the AutoClean <laughs> commands. Uh, but it also tells you what the outputs look like and what things to look for in the outputs. It takes a while to actually get completely familiar with that. 
why things have happened. Um, and again, if, you've, uh, if you have repeated emails saying things are being thrown out, then it's good to go back and check out your status to see what's going on. Um, single day solutions, you can over constrain. Uh, these days, the IGS orbits, they are typically uh, good five millimeters. We don't have problems with that. Again, if you're prior to 1996, uh, things are much shakier. And uh, again, hopefully, anyone planning processing data prior to the year 2000? Good, no one's raising their hands. <laughs> it's much easier after 2000. Uh, and then just, you know, again, just make sure that um, it's normally not a big issue that goes across. Uh, more subtle problems, if you have a high RMS for a particular station out of the autoclean, uh, the summary here is autoclean.post.summary. Uh, that could be water vapor on that day. If it's a recurring problem, it might be that it's actually multi-path at that site. Uh, we have had some bizarre cases, some continuous sites where someone actually parks a vehicle near the site. <laughs> and so it's been fine, and then all of a sudden for a one-week period, it's got really bad residuals, and then they go away because they moved the vehicle. So lots of things can happen. Sometimes someone will come in and build a fence. We've had that happen to us. And so it's been good. And then all of a sudden it gets really bad and it's going to stay permanently bad because they put that fence up. Uh, trees growing, vegetation is a real problem and a particularly a problem in uh, sort of the tropical sort of regions where things can grow very rapidly. We've often seen stations that have been very good and then slowly over a couple of years you'll actually see the quality degrading and you'll actually see the phase residuals developing this annual cycle to them in terms of RMS. And that's because in the summers, the the depends what season you're in, but in parts of the year the vegetation dries out and has less impact on the microwave radiation. And other times it's wet, becomes very conductive, becomes very reflective, and you start having bigger, bigger problems. So, uh, so that sort of thing, you sort of, as you do a lot of processing, just keep an eye on, you expect these things to look pretty much the same every day. And if they start evolving, it's you know, changing in ways you don't expect, it's good to look at that. Uh, the phase versus elevation angle plots are a good way to get a measure of that as you go across. Those things like trees, you'll often see in the phase sky plots, there's a part of the sky where the residuals are actually where you might actually be losing data from that part of the sky and because of blockage, etc. cetera. Um, and, uh, and again, when you're doing gamut with uh, survey mode stuff, worry about antennas not being level and centered over the mark. That hopefully a good field survey crew knows how to do that, so they do it. But again, you'll often find sometimes that you'll be off with no apparent reason. The phase residuals all look perfectly good. Everything looks great. It's just off by two centimeters. And then you'll find that, well, that was an uncalibrated tri-brac. That the user didn't realize that it was uh, the optical plummet in that tri-brac was completely out of calibration, and they literally pointed off. Sometimes an antenna will get bumped. You know, I noticed there's many cows around here, and cows and GPS antennas don't really go together. The cows like to sort of rub against them, and, and when they do that, they bend them over, they move them over a little, and so you end up getting a couple of centimeters off on your uh, side. I think we might actually have a, um, an example in track where that was what was diagnosed as exactly what had happened. Uh, so again, multipath, objects, uh, water, uh, snow on the antenna, you probably don't have that in this neck of the woods exactly, but as you go up into the Himalayas, for example, uh, sites up there with snow on the antennas is a real problem. Uh, again, general, it's, it's, when it really gets extreme, it's obvious. Um, you can really see large outliers and large residuals, but there's subtle places where there's some snow and ice on it, which will corrupt you, but not so bad. Um, and again, incorrect ambiguity resolution is reasonably rare these days as we go across. Uh, just a quick example of um, some things looking out lines. This is a sort of plot we will generate this afternoon, which is a time series uh, plot. And uh, so if you look across here, that scales about 10 millimeters. This is north, east, and up. And what you might notice is the north looks pretty good, east looks pretty good. But this one over here, the up day is off, seems to be off by uh, more than one would expect. And that is because on this particular day, the phase RMS was actually 9.6 millimeters, whereas for the other days, it was typically around uh, 6 millimeters or so. And uh, we think that was just bad atmosphere on that day. Um, and so again, it's, when you have continuous data, people tend to ignore this. 
because it's one day out of 365, and it'll just average out. If you're doing survey mode and it's critical, you might want to go back and start thinking about, well, do I need to put more atmospheric delay parameters in? Um, that sometimes helps, sometimes does not help as you go across. Sometimes you end up just saying, I'll just delete the data point. I'll just get rid of it. Uh, and again, so if you look at those uh, cases, this is those phase residual plots for that particular day. This is the bad day up here for six hours. This is the good day the following day. And you'll notice in here, you see a lot of yellow and green. See how spiky that is compared to that. And this is just bad weather at this site on that day. Um, and uh, then you see the stuff out here. This is the same each day. That's most likely multipath. But this bit up here where it's quite systematic you know, along that track and all of this is very smooth. So that's the sort of thing where you really go in in detail and start looking at, you can phase plots. Okay, so the summary, what we've looked at is those basic parameters, uh, the directory structures that we typically use for gamut, standard batch processing and what things we change, and then the interpretation of the important files. And we'll look more at that in the tutorial sessions. And as I've said, I'm hoping we're actually, we'll have some bad data because if all the data looks really good, it's not going to tell us very much. Uh, and then we looked at things that can go wrong. And again, those, hopefully you get a couple of good things first. And then when the things that go wrong show up, you can actually say, ah, oh, that's different from what I saw before. And then start thinking about how to explore what changed on that processing. Okay, questions? You have said that uh, there is make x function is there. Make x that converts the Rhinex file into x files. So the x files, yes. Yeah. So x files are like binary files or no? No. No, the x files, the question was what's the difference between Rhinex and x to a large degree. The x files are an ASCII formatted file. Mm -hmm. The difference is simply um, they have uh, every epic of data mm -hmm. is in the file. And so if there is no data at some time, there's actually lines that represent that. It's to allow us to easily work our way through the, the file. Um, and it has, and again, it has specific columns that the shooter range and the phase are in, as opposed to the Rhinex, where the ordering of the observables on the lines is actually quite different, uh, can be different from, from okay, file uh, to file. Should I say like that, that X files are very proprietary to the uh, gamut yes. for easy processing? For better processing, is it? Or yeah, it's for ease of processing in gamut. They are, right. they, they, the, the format predates the Rhinex format. Okay. So okay. had we, had Rhinex been there earlier, we might have well directly read Rhinex. But, okay. Okay. but we already had all the infrastructure set up to do the X files. But okay. yeah, they're ASCII files. You can look at them, read them, um, and uh, see what's in them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, apart from that, you have said constrained pre and constrained fixed solution. Right. So I believe that pre and fixed is for the ambiguity resolution. That's correct. Ambiguity pre and ambiguity fixed. That's correct. Right. But what do you mean by constraint solution? Okay. So uh, yeah, there's four solutions that are run, two of which the user controls. So generally, in that thing we call the SIT table, the IDS stations, we will put constraints on their position of about plus or minus one to five centimeters, depending on the quality of the station. And the idea of that is simply to provide a framework to keep the solution sort of centered on the Earth. Mm -hmm. Because okay. if we did not do that, it would tend to drift around a little. Mm -hmm. So we call those constrained solutions. Okay. So, so there's the constrained solution. That user sets those constraints. Then there is fixed and free. And that is the ambiguities. Now, when we want to go into globe K, we don't want any of the IGS a priori stuff to bias our solution. So numerically, uh, for those who know about covariance matrices and solutions and normal equations, we actually remove the user constraints that were supplied to the station coordinates and replace them with what we call loose constraints. And those typically tend to okay, so and that's what we then output. That's what into globe K. That, because that's done at the covariance matrix level, mm -hmm. it's fast, mm -hmm. and we can do it to the, or the covariance matrix after ambiguity resolution. So we can generate an ambiguity resolved 
solution which has loose constraints on the coordinates at the same time. Okay. And that's the four solutions that are generated. Okay. May I say like that the user specified one to five centimeter of constraint on right. the IGS position. That means uh, it is a kind of covariance, does it? Yeah, it's covariance only. Yeah, it's a coordinate. It's an a priori uncertainty place. Up here, five yeah. centimeter, one to five centimeters. So, like, let's say in the worst case, I assign five centimeters. Right. On the other hand, when we go for a loose solution, right, the system, the gamut system itself, or globe K maybe, replaces that five centimeter by ten meters. Yes. It? Right. Yeah, so gamut does that. Oops. A lot of ambiguity means uh, in that there is uh, uncertainties there. Yes. So, yeah, it allows the coordinate system to move around essentially. Oh, uh, what's the purpose of that? What's the main purpose? Well, because um, again, this all dates from when we didn't know things as well as we know them typically these days. But the idea is that we are doing this to generate uh, ultimately IGS solutions as well, right. and so we don't want to bias our solution. When you put an a priori constraint on something in a least squares solution, yeah. you bias it towards that a priori value. Okay, and, okay, and so okay, by okay, putting okay. that loose number on, uh -huh. we remove any of that bias happening. And so we are, in theory, quite insensitive to the actual a priori coordinates being used. Okay. Uh, I can understand that uh, even if you assign a bad a priori, like 10 meters, right. it's still if my solutions are lying close to the 5 centimeter, it will gradually bring to the 5 centimeter, the least square solution. We we'll keep on updating those things, covariances. No, this is... Uh, this is done one day at a time. Okay. And and I'm not sh I'm not sure the point I'm not quite sure the point you're making. Uh, when we put a 10 meter constraint on a single day, right. uh, when we have many many days of data, yeah. you are correct that the that single constraint gets reapplied every single day. Right. So if you it's 10 meters, then if you do it a thousand, so if we do it a hundred times. Mm -hmm then it would drop to the average of 100 times would be about one meter. And then if we wanted to get it to 10 centimeters, we would have to do it for 100 years. The reason we do 10 meters is that for the amount of data that we have, 20 years worth of data, those individual constraints we do not think have great influence on the final result. Okay, okay, okay. That's why we take a large range of 10 meters. That's why we take a large range of 10 meters, yes. Okay. Now, and if we won't talk about it in detail, but a really important concept when you're putting constraints on things mm -hmm. is it is really the ratio of how well your data intrinsically determines that parameter right. to the constraint you place. That ratio is the critical one. Okay. And so since intrinsically GPS is good at about one centimeter or better. Nowadays. Yeah, nowadays. Okay. Or actually, even in the 1980s, it was that good. Okay. Um, uh, 10 meters mm -hmm. is something like five orders of magnitude different. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that is a long, that's a lot of freedom. And I think reduce, it turns out the bias is actually proportional to that squared. Yes. So we have about a 10 to the minus 10 bias introduced by doing this. Okay, so we are mostly, we can say, we are unbiased. We're bound, that's, what we, that's what we're achieving. We're trying to achieve an unbiased solution, but while maintaining numerical stability okay. in the covariance matrix. Okay. So, yeah, and again, there's subtlety about normal equations versus covariance matrices right, and, right. and rank deficiencies. But yeah, this is designed to be as unbiased as we can be while maintaining numerical stability. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So my question is regarding the mapping function. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that slide, you were explaining about the atmospheric models and the mapping models. Right. So uh, you mentioned a university that updates the data for every six hours. And in the slide you mentioned that the file needs to be updated daily. So my question is that mapping function, is it uh, the uh, mapping function that gamut is using? Is it a global map mapping function or for example, Gypsy has its own mapping function for uh, atmospheric delays and Bernie's has its own mapping function for uh, atmospheric and tropospheric delays. And in books we have read about Niels mapping function and modified Niels mapping function. So which ma uh, mapping function is gamut using and uh, which uh, mapping function is being updated by the university union on a six hour basis? Okay. It has to do with the atmospheric delay mapping functions. And there is many of those types of functions out there used by different groups. Gamut actually has a choice of quite a few that you can choose you can if you want to use. The one we recommend, if you're just doing um, 
you know, you know, if you're doing your standard processing, is the uh, GPT models, the global pressure temperature models deduced by the University of Vienna group. There's a second version of that now, GPT-2, uh, and, G and GMF-2, I think is the GMF, global mapping function. And so those are spherical harmonic expansions. Those work quite well. And for most things you want to do, that's perfectly good. Next level of quality, uh, as far as we can tell, is and a map. These are the ones that are deduced from global three-dimensional um, assimilation models of the atmosphere by ray tracing through those models and essentially summarizing the, the results of that ray tracing, putting them out into a file that is gridded across the world and you, linear, you interpolate that grid. Those, we think, capture at least variations and stuff happening at the six-hour level. And those coefficients are then interpolated linearly uh, throughout the 24 hour period of data. So, sir, in gamut, we have option for choosing mapping model and say atmospheric model or uh, ocean turtle model. Right. Is there an option using CES table? In the CES table is where you set those model, model. names. Um, and yeah, and then CES table, there's entries at the beginnings of the lines, but then there's comments later on in the line that tell you what the options are that you can use out there. So sir, in case I have to just uh, say analyze the impact of a certain model on a daily observation of a single data right. from a single station, so I can do that by uh, changing the models in SAS table. Yes. You could, yeah, in, um, yeah, if you wanted to look at a single station. The impact of a model. Yeah, on a, yeah. A certain model on a randomness observation, 24 hour randomness observation. Yeah, you can change that and then um, this, I, I'm just thinking logistically the easiest way to do it. If you did a, you could certainly change it to solutions. Um, so one of the, yeah, so the, yeah, you could run a solution and then uh, change this table, another one. One of the options in SH gamut, which we did not use yesterday, but is uh, available, is this minus NET extent option. And so what we'll do is whatever you type after here, whatever that little string is, will get appended to the name directory. And so what it allows you to do is you might have one which would be, you might, if you wanted to run VMF, You might set CES table to run VMF, and you'd put VMF for that. And then you might want to run uh, GPT. So you'd change CES table, change that, and then those two would appear in different directories, uh, and then you could look at the comparison between them. Sir, this is more related to the experiment that we performed yesterday, actually. Mm -hmm. the, the process actually the baseline position of IITK. Right. So actually, when we did the experiment, all sites, Jan, Cross, uh, XP, and Info, right. we did very nice stations. So actually, the uh, corrections, these are based on the baselines of all the IDC stations, or the corrections are performed on the basis of all the eight sites in the eight sites. Sorry, what was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. For example, we go to the IITK data. Yeah, the I, yeah, yeah, right. Yep. So all this, the rest of the eight stations, is it getting the data from those? Or we are using the data of all the other IGS stations? We're using, in the solutions we yesterday, we're using all the data from the IGS stations and the data from your station. Uh, and that's all done in a single solution in which all the coordinates of all the stations are actually estimated. In the one that you actually looked at in the Q file output, the IGS has been constrained typically to plus or minus about five centimeters. And so you will look at what the coordinates were you got for the station. But if you look in the Q file, it will tell you what it was uh, for those. Is, was that your question? Yeah. Uh, actually, my question is the number of IGS stations you're using for the development. The, the number of IGS stations. The number of IGS. How many, have there been how many downloads for the IGS? Ten or so. Okay, ten. Ten. Yeah, all ten. Yeah, this is all done simultaneously. Uh, so it's... So it's uh, the way gamut works. So fundamentally in GPS processing, you want to estimate the satellite clocks for every one of the satellites. 
and the receiver clocks for every one of the receivers except one. You need one, one, you need one clock that actually tells you what the time is. To, and that has to be done to about a microsecond. So you take all of the data and you estimate simultaneously the coordinates of all of the stations, all of the clocks except one uh, ground-based clock or one satellite clock, it doesn't matter. And that's the that's really well. There's no particular reference. Station is actually no different to any of the other stations in that solution when you do it. That's a standard, what we would call uh, one-way processing. What gamut does is rather, because those clocks you have to estimate, they have to be estimated every 30 seconds. So there's 2,800 of those parameters for every satellite, for every station. So you can start multiplying those numbers out, but that's about 28,000 parameters that are up there. 